and or we're at one minute past. Let's get the show on the road. Uh, so hello and welcome to uh, this month's Sydney DevOps meetup. Uh, I'm Lindsay and my co-host Michael is lurking somewhere um, in the background uh, and uh, we're the co-organizers of the meetup here. Uh, before we uh, before we get going, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia. Uh, in my case today, that's the Green Guy people, and recognise their continuing connection to land, uh, waters, and culture. We pay respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. So, uh, welcome to the September meetup. Uh, appreciate you all joining. And if weather's starting to warm up a little bit, or if you're in the northern hemisphere, starting to cool down a bit. Either way, things are changing. Uh, just a quick reminder on the code of conduct. Uh, we've been doing these online meetups now for uh, for a couple of months, but uh, in case you haven't seen this before or need a bit of a refresher, um, DevOps Sydney uh, doesn't tolerate harassment of meetup participants in any form uh, or communication should be appropriate for a professional audience and that harassment uh, that includes sexist, racist or exclusionary jokes is not appropriate here. And the really nice thing about doing these meetups online is that I've got a whole host of tools to kick people that do douchey things. So uh, we haven't had an instance of that yet, but I am just waiting for the moment because that's the way that these things tend to go these days with the Zoom bombings and all. So hopefully we're gonna have a lovely time tonight. Uh, the agenda for tonight, uh, it's nice, short and sharp. Uh, we've got a lovely international guest joining us. Uh, so we're doing the intro right now. Uh, and we've got Sebastian giving the main talk. Uh, we're going to have a quick events and job section and then a lightning talk at the end. Uh, so for the main talk tonight, uh, we've got Sebastian phoning in from Germany, talking about the Terraform CDK uh, and uh, applying CDK in, in a Terraform world, which should be super interesting to see. Uh, jobs for the job section, just a quick uh, quick notice ahead of time. Uh, when we get to that, you'll, there'll be uh, you know, either if you're looking to fill a position or you, you want to fill it, want, want to be the person that fills the position, um, you'll have uh, 30 seconds to either uh, you know talk about yourself or talk about the position that you're trying to fill. You know that things are uh, definitely getting a bit harder jobs wise at the market, as uh, job market wise at the moment, given that um, you know all of the stimulus is slowly tapering off. So uh, I expect that we'll, uh, we'll have a few more of these uh, a few more positions popping up and more people looking for work in the in the next little bit. But I'm just preempting that uh, just to give you uh, a little bit of notice when we get to that after the main talk today. And then the lightning talk is uh, just going to be a quick five minute one from Rob Garth talking about uh, automating managers. And uh, we may have a bit of uh, conversation at the end of that as well. We'll see how that goes. All right. So uh, normally I would do a quick show of hands. Um, it's somewhat difficult in a, in a virtual environment. I, we've got all these like magical Zoom features to do like virtual show, show of hands, but uh, if, you, if you've got a moment and uh, you feel like taking off uh, or putting your video on, uh, quick show of hands, who here is a first timer today? Hey, a bunch of people in the chat as well. And this, uh, we've got Andrew that's uh, popped up with, uh, with one of the Zoom hands, which those controls seem to change in every single meeting. So uh, congrats on finding them. Uh, that's, the, that's the wonder of Zoom. Um, and uh, last question here, how far have you come? So that doesn't include you, Sebastian, because you are the invited guest. Um, we all know that you're coming from Germany, but is there anybody that's coming anywhere further afield than, than Germany? Or maybe even a little bit closer to Australia, but not in Australia. Ah, excellent. We've got Raf that's just come in from the kitchen. So congrats. Uh, oh, we've got Martin that's popped up from uh, from Germany as well. It's lovely to have you on board again, Martin. And Bill from Hong Kong. And it's lovely to have you here. Oh, Manjul from India. Spectacular. Okay, we're going like super international today. It's lovely to have you uh, all aboard. Ah, and somebody from Melbourne, which is basically feels like another country at this point, <laughs> given quarantine. So... Uh, my respects for, uh, for hauling through that. It's, uh, it sounds really, really tough down there. All right, so we're just going to jump straight into it. Uh, we've got Sebastian talking about the Terraform CDK. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, hand it over to Sebastian. Yeah, cool. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, then I will just share my screen. So, Terraform CDK. So, I think it was pretty much two months ago when I was talking at the DevOps Sydney meetup about the AWS CDK. And I think at the same day we actually launched the Terraform CDK. 
um, which is, well, like the third member of the CDK family. Um, and so there's that, there's AWS CDK, there's the CDK for Kubernetes, and now there's this Terraform CDK, which all share, well, like a few common, uh, common items, um, like the underlying logic, um, but are individual products. And well, today I'm going to talk about like briefly about like uh, what we did there, why we did this, and um, there will be like a demo of something I'm working on at the moment. Um, so it's like uh, half I finished, um, but I think it's uh, good to convey the idea that uh, what this is actually about in the end. Um, so like the CDK for Terraform, that's taken from the launch blog post. Um, and it's it's in the end really taken. Um, it's enabling you to to use TypeScript and Python um, to to generate um, Terraform configuration. And the good thing in contrast to the AWS CDK is that you really have access to the entire ecosystem of Terraform. Um, so which means like you can use pretty much any provider which there is. And I've used a bunch of them already and. Um, and there are like a few bugs which we fixed along the way, but um, overall, it's quite quite stable, I think, when it comes to the actual provider generation. Um, yeah, but let's talk about like what like I think like when you when you attended the last talk, so um, it's like uh, in the end like it, it shares the similar foundations as the AWS CDK. So which means um, the actual Packages which we are using are constructs, which is like the cloud API or like this, this tree model, which enables you to um, construct a tree of resources um, and you know navigate this tree and so on and so forth. So we will see this in, in the demo. And I think the most important component um, when it comes to the CK is JSII, um, which is sort of the interoperation model for making polyglot libraries possible. So Everything from CDK core is written in TypeScript, and so are the provider schemas that you generate. And from there on, um, we can generate Python and Java at the moment. Um, and we do all of this based on configuration, so like on the provider schemas. Terraform has, has the option, that, like the Terraform CI has the option to generate not really a JSON schema in that sense, but um, it's like, a schema which describes um, the resources and attributes um, of any given given provider. And we use this as an input, generate TypeScript configuration out of it, and make it uh, usable in Python and Java as well. Um, yeah, so that's, I think th these are the three input uh, components which, which we are talking about when we, when we mean the Terraform CDK. Oops. Mm. And so this constructs library, so I think I touched on this on the last talk as well in the AWS CDK. Um, and the AWS CDK itself is only working with cloud formation. Um, and the, the core team of the AWS CDK is actually providing abstractions, right? So not only wrapping raw cloud formation, but providing abstractions to use like a load balancer or like a VPC or similar things. Um, and then out of those abstractions, um, which are the level two constructs, they are going to provide patterns like a load balance target service, for example, you know, like a load balancer, which uh, talks to a target service in an ECS cluster and so on and so forth. Um, that's what they did pretty much over the course of the last two years. And we, from like in Terraform CDK, don't have this at the moment. So what we do at the moment is we can generate the well, similar thing to like a level one construct, which means it's really like a one-to-one -one mapping between the, like a Terraform resource and uh, like a CDK construct, which you're talking about. Like an ECS service would, would be like one construct, for example, um, which leads to this thing that 
uh, when you look at this, it's like quite familiar if you're familiar with Terraform. Like the attributes are looking really, it's like a one to one mapping. <clears throat> and why is that? Since well, level one constructs can be generated out of this provider schemas, and level two constructs and level three constructs um, are really manual work. And in the demo, I'm going to show like a bit of like the approach which I'm trying at the moment to abstract this a little bit. Um, but at the moment, we are not really in the position to to provide for every every schema or like for every provider proper proper abstractions. It would be pretty great if the individual provider teams would do this. Um, but yeah, at the moment, it's uh, it's just level one constraints for now, out of the box. Um, <clears throat> and like just to to get to like a, like a like a model like a mind mind model for this, um, out of those level one constructs, um, the Terraform CDK generates HTL compatible JSON. So Terraform takes input. Usually it's HTL's input, but it totally understands JSON as well. There are like a few edge cases um, where we have to provide some workarounds since it's like in, in some cases not fully compatible. Um, but so far, it's uh, well, we were able to work around all the issues. And under the hood, um, it's still the Terraform CLI uh, just doing its its thing. So which means it will just fit in any workflow which you have. Um, it could be like you know like any GitHub action or um, Atlantis or like I don't know Terraform Cloud or whatever it is. Um, in the end, you could just take the entire generated JSON um, and you know apply it via the Terraform CLI. You don't have to do this. We do have like our own CLI wrapper. Um, which then just orchestrates the Terraform CLI under the hood. Um, but in the end, yeah, it's just Terraform. And therefore, the execution happens through Terraform and the actual providers. <clears throat> so that's, uh, yeah, well, one thing to keep in mind, it's really like a layered approach. And um, yeah, so like after you synthesize from, from the, your TypeScript code or your Python code or Java code, to JSON, you don't really need any any other tool rather other than the Terraform CLI. <clears throat> um, and this is pretty much the schema which, or like the pattern which uh, which is common across all the different CDKs. Um, we all use like some kind of input schema, input schema spec. Um, do something with that, and then the end. Uh, JSII and constructs um, is enabling it to render down other uh, other configuration. So the, the key takeaway here is that the CDK itself is not doing um, orchestration or like uh, API calls in order to provision any resources. Uh, it's in the end really like a mechanism to um, convert code in configuration basically. <clears throat> and I think like um, there are like other people playing around with like you know with you know on other areas as well, um, but like a, a similar concept. So perhaps uh, there will be even more in the future. You'll see. Um, since it's like I think like a bit abstract, um, let's just look at an example. Oops. So I will increase my font size if that's possible. So um, what I'm playing around with at the moment is like a Docker dropkick uh, well, construct package library, how you like to call it. And in its, uh, well, uh, the idea is to take like a Docker file and uh, provision whatever is available as a serverless Docker orchestration thing in the given cloud. At the moment, I'm using AWS and the Google Cloud, and I'm going to show like a bit of, um, well, like a few abstractions and um, how this actually works. In order to use this, 
uh, well, we, we do need Terraform 012 upwards, uh, Node, yeah, well, and Docker in this case. Um, yeah. And so how this looks like is, first of all, usually in, in any Terraform CDK project, you do have a cdk.tf.json, which allows you to configure how, how you do it. Um, when, you, when we think about, um, for example, how do you pull in providers? There are like two ways to do this. Um, how do you generate those, this configuration? Um, uh, we do provide pre-built packages, pre-built provider packages for major clouds like AWS, Google, Azure, uh, I think the Docker provider and like a few other ones. Um, so they can just be pulled in <coughs> via NPM uh, or like PyPy or whatever it is in the end. Um, and they will, you know, just ship all the, all the configuration uh, which is required to actually do the, provide those resources. Um, in this case, I'm using both. So I'm using like a few pre-built providers and I'm using um, like an like actual generated provider. Um, and out of this configuration, I can use this Terraform CDK uh, CLI to generate like provider configuration. That's all generated out of the configuration, uh, provider configuration. Um, it's like a very small provider. So since, yeah, therefore it's not really, not really much. Like the AWS provider itself is, I think, two megabytes of configuration. Uh, so it's like quite a lot. Um, so, and in this product, we are, we are mixing this like a bit. <clears throat> and let's just look at the, like a Google stack in this case. So like, again, our goal is to, to take a, like a folder with a Docker file and uh, just provide it, uh, like deploy it to the cloud. Um, so we do use a construct, we use the CDK for Terraform library, we use the pre-built providers and we use like a few internal things uh, like the abstractions, like the level two things. And um, in the end, it's like, a, like a, what we are seeing here is the provider which directly comes from, uh, from the pre-built package. And then we see a few abstractions here. <clears throat> And in particular, this Docker asset is probably interesting um, since that's sort of abstracting this a bit. So the, the idea there is that it, that it provides you like a registry in any cloud. And um, therefore, when you, when you look at this, you, well, you know, you, uh, depending on in which stack this thing uh, is placed, it will do the right thing. Uh, so it will find, if, so it will find uh, out if, if it's running in an AWS context or like a Google context and um, doing, well, it's doing it, its thing then, uh, which means like here's a switch. Uh, so it's either using an, an ECR repository or like a Google container repository, <clears throat> which is uh, what we're doing here at the moment. And here we are seeing the actual resources, right? So here's the actual container registry and um, the uh, Google Container Registry Repository as a data source. So it's not, so it, it, it's, it's not really important, like all the details here. The only thing to, to, to care about is uh, that it's, it's like a full programming language in, in TypeScript and um, it's composable. So like you can, um, it's, it's more than just converting TypeScript into JSON. Uh, you know, like this one-to-one -one mapping, you can actually use it to, to provide logic and um, um, abstractions, which are re reusable. And compared to Terraform modules, for example, <coughs> uh, Terraform modules are a namespace um, in, in Terraform. Uh, and we, while you can use existing modules, you can't, we, we don't really provide the mechanism to, to do this. Uh, like natively in Terraform CDK since we don't really need it. Um, so whenever we provide an abstraction, um, we essentially build another tree in the node. So we have like a, like, a, like the, the entry level is the, the root level. And then each abstraction is like one, one for the node and therefore this needs, um, 
is used as, a, as sort of like a namespace via the, the path in the tree. So what I mean by this is, <coughs> when we do this, so this is just like an example. I will increase the font here. <coughs> so where we use a CDKTF uh, CLI to, to deploy our stack, which happens to be in the examples folder Google Main.js. And um, it, it shows like, like, a, like a pretty uh, simple diff. So it's not a detailed diff in this case. If you need this, and you can probably do this, um, you can still fall back to the Terraform CLI. And this will you know, just work as well. Uh, it's only, it's like more detailed and there are like stories to, to make this more granular and more detailed since it's like sometimes it's really important to, to know what's happening under the hood. Uh, but at the moment uh, we have for us like more important things to do. And what this command, which we, which we ran here, like the CDKTF deploy, what's actually doing, it's, it's, it's using the, the TypeScript code and it's converting it into, into JSON. And then it's changing into, into the folder and doing the Terraform plan and we're passing the output and so on and so forth. Um, how the synthesizing is, look, uh, is looking like is uh, this. <clears throat> um, so that's like just ignore those comments here. So that's just metadata. Um, so, but in the end, it's really like synthesized JSON HCL, and uh, it you know it's like entirely self-contained. So you can take this and uh, this entire folder and you know put it somewhere. Plus, uh, the entire folder is also like a throwaway folder, so you can just throw the entire folder away and then regenerate everything. Um, yes, and then when we do deploy this, <clears throat> so it's uh, creating the Google Container Registry, it's creating like a service, uh, it's fetching the latest uh, image char from the given repository. And in the end, it will hopefully spit out some URL where we can access this file, uh, this, this thing which we just built. And here it is. <clears throat> there is uh, the repository. Let's find this file. Here it is. And so when we rerun this, it should detect that there's a change. It should just update the repository and uh, you know, reapply this thing <clears throat> to the Google container, uh, how's it called, Google, Google Cloud Run. Yeah, here we go. Yes, we do want this and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so again, so it's like a half, have finished, um, but the idea is this runs in uh, like the Docker asset. Is it ready already now? Uh, this runs in Google, and in theory, when we compare this, um, so the Docker asset itself is uh, just the same construct. And uh, it would just work in <clears throat> in AWS and in Google, and you could use it to start it into like another abstraction, which is like the Google Container Service or like an AWS Container Service, for example. Um, and it's it's really mix and match in the end. Um, <clears throat> and oh, but we but we don't have. I think uh, the important thing to to, to know or like to, to think about is since it's like all code and which is uh, like synthesized at a, like at a later stage, like at, at this stage actually, you can actually um, post-process whatever we generate. So when we take this LOS stack, for example, or like this Google stack, let's take this Google stack maybe, that's maybe the better thing. <clears throat> 
Where was it? Here. So we can just take this entire thing. So we do have deployed this particular stack here. And we can use apply remote state. Let's look at this. Uh, it takes a stack and um, it's, you know, like adds like other resources. Uh, you could remove resources. You could uh, change existing resources. Like what we do here below, for example, is uh, iterating through the entire tree and finding certain taggable resources and tag all of them at once, basically. But in our case, we did deploy this here. And in theory, we should, since we switched the, the, the Terraform backend from like a local state to remote state, we should see like an entire new diff since the uh, state backend did change now. And let's see if that happens. And there we go. So it's like, uh, like it's now talking to um, this backend here, which I did configure beforehand. So it's like signed up, like, you know, the credentials are there. So it's, it's just working for this reason. Um, but you can imagine, you know, like uh, if you would use this in a, like a larger context, larger organization, you could distribute packages and, uh, you know, like change them as you like, or like amend them if you like, basically with, uh, tagging or with uh, security features um, and whatnot. Um, so yeah, so this should be updated. Yes, so it just works. And yeah, so that's like a quick work in progress demo. Um, the gotchas at the moment are still, it's still alpha and it's, um, I mean, we improved quite a bit over the last two months and we do have like a bunch of open source contribution which is quite nice, um, but it's still alpha. So like the, there are a few, a few flaws around the schema itself, um, which are not really critical, but you know, sometimes they're annoying. Um, it's like the entire synthesizing process is synchronous, um, which is sometimes surprising um but i think there will be like a few workarounds to, to tackle this um yeah and refactoring with state is always a pain um i hope you will provide like a few helpers to to make this less painful um but you know like particularly when you move around resources <clears throat> it's the same as in terraform or as in confirmation it's yeah it's always like a bit tricky the state yeah, sure. In part, in, like the benefits, uh, imperative programming, um, like the composable construct that you touched on, um, dependency management is probably one of the bigger things I was actually missing um, in the last projects. Um, and I think at the moment it's really like an emerging ecosystem, um, um, and I'm, I'm expecting that it's like, well. Uh, there will be more members of the CDK family, and I think there will be like a more bus in the last in, in the next few months, I think. Yeah, so I mentioned the schema stability as an outlook already. So it's like uh, I mean we are we're getting there, it's uh, yeah, yeah, like a bit tricky. C sharp is still on the list. So as more we do have three languages, um, TypeScript, Python, and Java. Go um so the jsi implementation just started and it's expected i don't know end of the year early next year um and then golang will be available and interoperability between all the different cdks it's not really straightforward possible at the moment um we would really love if we could reuse like the abstractions from the aws cdk since, well, that's where the majority of the effort uh, was put into in the last two years. And therefore, it, would be, it wouldn't really make sense to re-implement everything which they did already. Um, but there are, of course, challenges. Uh, at the moment, the idea is to, to have some sort of um, 
well, transpiler, which uh, converts confirmation into Terraform and vice versa. Um, but yeah, so it's like, uh, like an ongoing research and ongoing project, uh, how this might actually possible. I think for CDK, it's like CDK for Kubernetes, uh, it's probably not that difficult <clears throat> since you can just use whatever they generate as YAML and uh, deploy this. So, but like between CDK and CDKTF, it's, yeah, you'll see. But I'm, uh, yeah, I'm optimistic that it will happen, uh, but I'm not sure when it will happen and like to which extent this will actually happen. Yeah, so there are like a few resources. I mean, uh, like the first link uh, just redirects to the repository. The second link is uh, a learning, learning resources by HashiCorp itself. And yeah, then like the, the last link is just like a few um, yeah, blog posts and project and stuff. There will be a CDK day in roughly two weeks. Mm. And it's like, like, I think five or six hours um, covering all the different CDKs. And I think it will be pretty interesting. I will also talk about uh, the interoperability thing between all the different CDKs. And yeah, uh, it's free. So just sign up on cdkday.com. And in general, like if you're interested in the topic CDK dev, uh, there like if there's a Slack channel, like a Discord uh, server, and um, yeah, just join and uh, hang out and ask questions if you have any. <coughs> For that event, and, Sebastian, um, what time zone is that in? We said EST. Is that AEST or US EST? Or um, yeah, that's a good point. I think for Australia, it's actually quite bad. Um, it's, <clears throat> hang on. So it's my time, 3 p.m., I think, 3 or 4 p.m. So it's like, probably Sydney is like uh, 10 or 11 p.m. <coughs> yeah, yeah, true. That's cool. We'll, we'll do the time zone conversion and put it in the, on the comments on the meetup so people can decide ahead of time if they need to commit to that time or not. <coughs> Talks will be recorded and published, so. <coughs> Awesome. All right, any questions for Sebastian? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Hi. Hi, maybe here's uh, Martin from Germany too. Um, the level one constructs on the AWS CDK, I think they are kind of automated, generated from the uh, CloudFormation syntax or what or schema and uh, this is not right now the, the case in uh, for terraform cdk or this is quite still manually or um <clears throat> sorry <clears throat> um yes correct um the so level one resources are always generated um so in for aws cdk this means it's generated from the confirmation spec for Terraform CDK, it means it's um, generated from the provider um, um, ah, I was looking for an example. Anyway, um, so <clears throat> the level one constructs are also generated in the CDK for Terraform case, but from the provider specification. So and that's that's the reason it's 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 not compatible with uh, the AWS CDK. So it's like different type of configuration which is generated from and therefore also uh yeah it's a different thing so it's not compatible but it's generated it's not manual so what is manual is like abstractions so if you want to for example in area cdk there's this load balance target service which consists of like i don't know like 20 resources or so and uh, this is manual work yeah okay thank you Awesome. Any other questions for Sebastian before we wrap up the talk? Nope. Fantastic. All right. Thank you very much, Sebastian, from, uh, for phoning in. Well, not really phoning in, zooming in. There you go. And uh, yeah, for giving this that yeah, thanks It's really me. great to see. Awesome. All right.
let's keep moving then. Um, oh, just refreshing the slides. Okay. So there we go. All right. Uh, next up, we've got uh, events, just a quick little events and job section. Um, the uh, next major event that is coming up is funnily enough, the CDK day. Um, so I'll pop that in there. Uh, awesome time zone overlap for us. It is from 12 a.m. to 5 a.m. So if you're already up and like watching the tour, th actually the tour will be done by then, but you will have trained by then by watching the tour. So you'll be primed and ready to go from, from 12 to five. Uh, but otherwise there will be the recordings of it. But if you were like super pumped for it, there's your opportunity. Uh, other things that are perhaps more friendly for our time zone, um, we've got the product remote uh, conference from Web Directions that's kicking off uh, in November. Their code remote one um, yeah, started a couple of days ago. Um, and they've got an interesting format that, they, that they're experimenting with there where it's a, it's a couple of hours but spread over a couple of weeks. Um, so they've got that one with the product conference. Uh, they've also got a design one as well that's worth checking out. Um, there's DevOps World by CloudBees, which is happening next week. Um, that is similarly terribly timed, um, but that's cool because they're also publishing all of their uh, all their content online, so you'll be able to go watch it afterwards. Uh, but uh, that's going to be a pretty interesting conference. There's the Enterprise Summit as well um, that's happening in Las Vegas. Again, that's, well, <laughs> Las Vegas slash virtual. Uh, it's, it's entirely virtual. Nobody is actually going to be together for that, but it's entirely online, which actually makes it, you know, achievable for a bunch of us to attend. Uh, and that's on October 13th to the 15th. All right, so that's the end of events uh, for the time being, unless anybody's got one and feel free to message that through to me and I'll, uh, I'll pop in a slide at the end as well so we can talk about that. Uh, but this next section, uh, very briefly, is for jobs. So um, if anybody has been, uh, is, is looking to fill a position or at the moment, or they're looking for work, um, now is your chance to, uh, to talk about the position. So um, you'll have 30 seconds. Uh, do we have anybody that, uh, that is keen to, uh, to speak up and talk about a position they're hiring for or talk about themselves? Don't all speak at once. <laughs> it's very daunting to do this in front of 27 people that you don't know. So I can jump in if you want, Lindsay. Let's do it. Go, Dave. Uh, I'm totally unprepared, but uh, hi, I'm uh, Dave McPherson. I'm an engineering manager within the Cash App at Square. Um, you will be potentially surprised to know they have an engineering presence in Australia, actually upwards of, of 70 folks. Uh, spread across the eastern seaboard. Um, I'm in the platform uh, group and uh, we do have a few open open positions. We're uh, quite agnostic in terms of, of geolocation. So uh, if you're interested in anything to do with uh, platform work, uh, I've, I'm actually looking after a storage team and a developer velocity team, um, but we've also got like PubSub, uh, Traffic and Compute uh, and observability, and uh, we've got a few open roles going in, in quite a few of those teams as well. So, uh, yeah, reach out. Uh, Lindsay knows how to get in touch with me if uh, if you don't know me at all. And uh, if you if you sit and think about it for the next month and come back about a month from now, um, Dave's going to be giving a lightning talk at our next meetup, so you can catch him then. All right, has anybody else got uh, any positions that they're looking to fill or uh, looking to uh, looking for a new job? All right, we might call it quits there, uh, but the opportunity is always here uh, as with every meetup and that tends to ebb and flow a bit um, from meetup to meetup. So who knows next month, we may just all be looking for work. Uh, that's that's 2020 for you right there. All right, so on that fun and happy upbeat note, we've got a lightning talk to finish up this evening. We've got uh, Rob Garth talking about automating managers. I'm gonna relinquish the screen and Rob, you can take all it away. Right. Lindsay, I'll just share this screen. Um, so really I'm talking about incident handling, but we'll get to automating managers at the end. Um, so my name's Rob Garth. I'm an engineering manager at Ping Identity. Uh, we have a site reliability uh, organization that kind of spans three uh, regions, APAC, the US and EMEA. 
Um, and so I'm the uh, engineering manager here in APAC. And because I'm an engineering manager, none of the things I'm gonna talk about today, I did any of the actual work on. I'll just take all the credit, but I, I didn't do the actual work. Um, so if you don't know Ping Identity, we are a um, authorization federated login company. We've been running for about 18 years. Uh, we have a bunch of on-prem enterprise software used by a bunch of places, but in the last few years, like everybody else, we've gone SaaS or ID as a service. So our site reliability organization looks after our IDAS platform. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about incident management, which is something that depending on your role, you've had to deal with, uh, probably all of us have had to deal with at some point. And so the current setup, we, what, what we had at Ping is probably a setup that we've all had. A critical alert will page the, an engineer from pager duty. It might be uh, one of the uh, service engineers and application engineer, or it might be a site reliability engineer. Uh, they'll confirm that's a real problem. And if it is a real problem and it is a, a P1 incident that's affecting customers, the very first thing they need to do is raise our incident commander to uh, escalate this further and get other people online while they continue to fix the, um, the issue. Uh, the incident commander's role, uh, our incident commanders is a, it's an encore roster with a director level people in the organization. Uh, and they'll, and, it's, and I quite, quite like the setup. They'll set up the Slack channel, kind of the war room. They'll set up a bridge on Zoom for us to order, order jump in on. And, and they'll bring engineers on as we need, any other resources we need for the outage. Uh, they'll handle communication with the customers and status updates on status IO. Uh, and of course, they've got direct level authority. So if we've got to spend money to fix or shut down a region or block a customer, we can do all of that uh, with their authority. So I, I like this setup, it, it kind of works. It, it takes all of that pressure. I've worked at companies where the poor chap who took the alert was handling all of this uh, and it's stressful and it's complicated. So, you know, I, I think a lot of us would have a, some kind of similar setup to this. The problem we were having though is Ping Identity has a 15 minute to fix goal. Now, in all honesty, I kind of think that is our SLA at the unobtainium level. I don't think I've ever been involved in a real problem that was 15 minutes to fix, but that is always our goal. And of course, an outage is, is high stress, especially if it's a big outage, everybody's stressed out. You might not have been on one for a while. The SRE has to go and look up which email address or how to raise the alert with pager duty to hit the income managers. The income manager might not have been on uh, an alert for a while. So they're gonna have to, they've probably been woken up, they're gonna have to go and find the, the confluence doc and run through and work out all the things they have to do. Typos happen, mistakes happen, and minutes really matter, especially when you've got this, you know, uh, this idea that we have to be back up. I mean, Ping supporting MFA solutions for millions of active accounts at any one time. So it matters that we have a quick response time. Uh, you know, so things like the Zoom meeting will be an after four. The channel won't be named correctly or information that's pertinent won't be in the right channel. Uh, when engineers get woken up, they're not quite sure where to join and what to look at. And all this manual time just takes away from the really critical stuff of getting back online. Um, and and you know, the SRE is left debugging without a room to debug until the incident commander gets on. So we were just finding precious minutes uh, getting lost to human error in this process. So like all good problems, we use DevOps to fix them. So our solution is robots. Um, and so I sat down with our site reliability engineering team, one particular one of my engineers, how can we automate this problem? How can we fix it? Because, you know, as an engineering team, if we have to do a manual job more than once or maybe more than twice, we're immediately talking about how can we automate this? How can we take this process away? Well, this was a manual process being run over and over again and incurring problems and it wasn't automated. So we, we created our income Slack bot. Uh, so the process now is a, a, the engineer who gets the page, confirms they're an incident and inside any channel on Slack, they just call the incom bot slash income it's an incident, so type an incident, and the current problem they're seeing. And the bot does really simple things. It creates a Slack channel named the way we expect and the name everybody's looking for when they get online. 
Uh, it creates the Zoom meeting, which seems really simple, but because of some security stuff that had just come through, we were building this out right when Zoom was being hassled about all their security implementation. So we weren't allowed to have an open bridge. We weren't allowed to have no password. We weren't allowed to um, use someone's personal meeting. So it was a whole bunch of engineering work to create a new Zoom meeting as the user that called the bot. We paste both of those uh, common names into a common channel on Slack, our alerts channel, which everybody has to be a member of. And once we have all that set up, which of course takes seconds, then we page the Incom manager with all that information in their page. So they can immediately be online, they can be in the right Slack room, they can be on the Zoom call, and all that time saved. And uh, so it's a fairly simple solution. Um, we have a AWS Lambda, which is our bot. Uh, the tricky part all came around Zoom. We have a, you know, Amazon KMS for non-changing tokens. It's easy to interact with Slack's API. It's easy to interact with um, uh, PagerDuty. Uh, Zoom was a real pain. They have a, a one-time use token. And once you've used it, then you get a new one and you throw it away. Uh, because the user that can create the Zoom meeting can actually create the Zoom meeting as any user in the organization from our CEO down. Um, and so we use Vault in our infrastructure to store this single use token uh, and replace it each time the bot runs. And it was really key that each step to this would be independent so that if any one of these steps in our, in our original process here failed, uh, almost like an interactive run book, the, the person who's instigated the... Uh, the incident bot will be told exactly what to do to set the thing up manually and it will move on to the next step. Uh, and that was basically, you know, it's about 300 lines of Python and it probably saves about three minutes in every outage. But as an organization, it's possibly the project which we've had the most, uh, most observed and the most praise from inside the organization to any other team, which is now, handling incidents is trying to implement something similar and all of our director level staff on the uh, incident roster are all very, very grateful for this process. And so I just wanted to kind of share this process of if we have a manual process that's broken, let's automate it, even if it's our boss. Awesome. Well, a hundred lines of code for every minute saved. That's not too bad. <laughs> All right, very good. Any questions for Rob on this one? Now we've got a question from Mick in the comments, so in the chat there, saying, have you seen uh, a long URL for Monzo about how they respond to incidents and they've open sourced their process and the code behind it? So have you seen that, Rob? I have not seen that. I think we, we'll all go have a look at that. We have not open sourced our code. Mainly it's very ping specific and ping is very, uh, it's not very open source friendly right now. Fair enough. Well, this might be the, the straw that breaks the camera's yeah. back, Rob. Yeah. It's worth having a look. Sorry, uh, Rob, it's worth having a look at the Monzo stuff, even if it's just inspiration. They've hooked it up to the Confluence as well. So it auto creates the, a page to radiate all the information out. To, to everyone else. Yeah, that's actually in our version two project for the next quarter where uh, we're going to start putting RCA debugging information in there too. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Very good. All right. Any other questions for Rob before we wrap this one up? That sounds like a no. All right. Thanks, Rob. Very much appreciate you jumping in at the last minute to, uh, to give us the goss on how you're managing incidents at ping. All right, we are in the home stretch here. Um, one last thing that's only just come about in the last couple of minutes, actually. We are having a special event in two weeks from now. Uh, so same time, it'll be in Zoom as well. We've got uh, Manuel Pace uh, from the Team Topologies folks uh, coming in and talking about uh, how to avoid monoliths and uh, doing that accidentally with CICD. Um, through uh, team interactions and, and redesigning the way that you work. Um, so that's going to be really interesting to see. Um, if you haven't come across the team topology stuff before, 
Um, it's a, a really great overview of a bunch of different ways that you can go about structuring yourself to, you know, to solve a lot of these, these sort of challenges that, you know, that DevOps was founded to solve in the first place. Um, so Manuel and his, uh, his business partner, Matthew, are very, very well known in the DevOps space. Um, and uh, I'm really excited to see what, uh, what he's going to be talking about in two weeks from now. So uh, keep that in your calendar. I'm about to announce that event on Meetup in just a moment. So um, love to see you then. Uh, other than that, we've got our regular October Meetup as well. So it's basically a, a DevOps Meetup every every two weeks for the next, um, well, including today, six weeks. So uh, buckle up. Um, we've got Toby Heat, who's going to be talking about uh, using waterfall and upfront analysis um, and a massive Gantt chart to solve uh, problems in tech. And yes, this is 2020. He's actually going to be giving a talk about waterfall. It's going to be super interesting to see. Uh, Toby's uh, got lots of interesting and, and cool ideas about different things. And we've got Dave, as we mentioned before as well, talking about why uh, Square Cash moved from Vitesse to TIDB. So if you are interested in giving a talk, uh, either a lightning talk or a full talk, uh, feel free to hit me up uh, either in the chat here or, uh, or pin, me up, pin me afterwards. And uh, I'd love to have you speak. All right, that is everything for tonight. Thank you very much to all of our speakers who have phoned in um, and giving the lovely content. It's uh, really great to see. Uh, looking forward to seeing you all uh, online next month or uh, sooner at the upcoming meetups. Thanks, you all. See you later. Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks, everyone.